First of all, thank you everyone for coming today to talk to us about uh, voice and hear our presentation about speech technology and what Mozilla is doing. Um, we are actually, we're very honored to be back here in the Mozilla Taipei office and in front of the Taiwan community. This project actually has its roots in Taiwan and in Taipei, uh, Mozilla Taipei community. Last May, uh, we came here and did a design thinking event with the Mozilla Taipei community to help us ideate or brainstorm on how we might, as Mozilla, collect voice data so that we could build open source speech technology. Um, and a lot of the ideas that came out of this workshop, it was a two-day workshop with 30 different people from many different fields like design, engineering, research, uh, uh, particle physics. Um, we came together and we had some ideas and they gave us the direction that you see today with the project we're going to talk about. So we're very honored to be back um, and it's fitting that we're back here to, uh, to circle back now that we are starting to collect. Chinese, traditional Chinese Mandarin. Yeah, so today um, we're going to talk about speech technology and what Mozilla is doing in speech technology and how you can get involved if you are interested. So we have a rough agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how Mozilla approaches innovation. Um, that will be Alex, who I'll introduce in a second. Then we're going to give a little overview about how voice assistants work today. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the two projects that we are here to talk about, which is Deep Speech and Common Voice. And Kelly Davis, who uh, heads machine learning at Mozilla, will be helping us talk about that today. So the first step, uh, we'd like to talk about open innovation and how Mozilla approaches new projects, and indeed how we came and, and worked with the Taipei uh, community. Alex. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> um, welcome to me. But, uh, I'm well, basically uh, on, as Michael. I've never been to Taiwan. I don't think I am, um, I'm impressed by seeing so many faces uh, in the office. So thanks for having us. Um, when Michael said we came to Taipei uh, for a design thinking workshop, uh, that was basically the open innovation team or parts of And um, generally, when we think about innovation, we think about this, like the next shiny tool, a uh, flying car, a uh, teleporter, you name it. Is it, is it better? Yes. 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 I feel important. <laughs> <laughs> so we think about like shiny tools, the next big thing. Um, but what is uh, equally important is the way how to get there. Like, how do we innovate? Um, it's important to look at the processes um, and kind of the, the methods you use to actually create that next solution. It's the way to uh, frame a problem and getting to a solution that might be unexpected, as with the Common Voice project. Um, we had a completely different vision for that before. Came to Taipei, uh, to the design workshop, and what came out of it was different than, than we expected. So innovation, when we talk about open innovation, uh, what do we mean? Usually innovation, or traditionally, uh, innovation happens uh, behind closed doors. It's like men in white coats um, innovating and uh, protecting their licenses, protecting their ideas, and uh, that's good, isn't it? The problem is um, it costs a lot of money and it excludes perspectives you might not uh, anticipate. Because the way you frame a problem um, is the way how you experience the world. Um, and it's based on uh, past experiences and the talent you have. And the problem with talent is, no matter who you are, you cannot hire all the smart people. The smart people always work for someone else. Um, but what you can do, and this is the way to approach innovation differently, is work in the open. Because you want all these perspectives included. You want to have deep expertise, for example, in machine learning, but you also want people that have an idea how to, how to market something, how to bring it to people that may be not ex experts in, in, in machine learning or in, in voice recognition. So open innovation is about uh, blurring the boundaries of an organization and excluding external perspectives and expertise and ideas into your own processes. And this is what 
Mozilla's open innovation team tries to do. So Mozilla, you know that, uh, has always been a pioneer of open source. So we generally work in the open. Um, that's not new. But what uh, we used to do, and that was kind of the mantra of Mozilla, is we are open by default. So we're just open. The problem is with default, the default, you sometimes lack intention. You sometimes don't know why you're doing this, and you have no strategy behind it. So with a broader set of technologies and products we developed, um, we needed to, to change our organization, we're trying to change our organizational processes towards a system that is more intentional and uh, that kind of uh, respects that there are different communities out there to work with, that respects that project needs might, might be different, um, so we can't generalize our approach. And we frame that um, as being open by design, so being very intentional about our openness. And uh, the Open Innovation Team today comprises about what, 35 people. Um, a large proportion is based in Berlin. And uh, what we're doing is basically uh, applying a broad set of open practices, not only being open source, but having innovation challenges, having uh, crowdsourcing approaches, but also having ideation processes around, okay, how do we actually frame a problem to get to a solution? We're applying these open practices across the life cycle of our technologies and our product development, and uh, to achieve that competitive advantage uh, in a market that is dominated by companies that could massively outspend that, that have uh, a large amount of uh, employees, and with uh, 1,100 employees and highly active uh, communities, there's no other way to compete with that but being very precise about your, your focus and uh, your intentions and leverage the skills you have outside the organization. So our team does basically that. Um, we're doing a lot of research, looking inside the organization, asking people that are community facing, that work with the universities, for example, with researchers, about their experience and how to best engage external parties. We're also doing external research, looking for other industries, other organizations that are very experienced, for example, NASA, having an amazing innovation center and using innovation challenge to solve uh, random problems that they couldn't do themselves. So this is the kind of the research part. We also apply, as Michael said, design thinking uh, and other kind of techniques, how to evolve around a problem and find, uh, define a problem space and find solutions that might be new. Um, what we also do is, and this is also part of what we're doing in Taiwan um, this week, is ecosystem outreach. What does it mean? So we're trying to engage with um, academic institutions, with uh, governmental institutions, with uh, startups, researchers, companies outside of Mozilla, trying to find common values, find, uh, trying to find uh, common interests, and find ways to collaborate so that we and external parties both benefit mutually. It's not about like uh, money exchange, but really leveraging common interests. Um, crowdsourcing, of course. And especially, uh, the Mozilla community space in Taipei are under the ecosystem outreach. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Um, in the field of crowdsourcing, um, we not only crowdsource solutions, um, but we also crowdsource problems. Um, if you run an innovation challenge, for example, you ask, um, uh, ask to find different perspectives on, on, a, on a problem. You actually try to find a way to frame something that you, you might not actually understand yourself. And in terms of crowdsourcing solutions, grand technological challenges that you can't work on with your own resources, you can crowdsource and find ideas also outside uh, actually your own industry. Open source, as I said, we're trying to be more strategic about it, uh, doing research around business models and also licensing uh, models, um, also how to develop communities around uh, open source projects. And this is a large part um, that also Michael is, is involved with, is community development around specialized projects. And um, what we're trying to do, and we're proving within Mozilla, and I I'm quite thankful that we're doing that, um, is trying to improve the contributor experience so that actually um, our collaboration works based on, we have open technology that actually works for both sides, uh, we have an inclusive environment that welcomes not only coders or experts, but also non-technical people, 
that would like to work with Mozilla and that would like to help advance the missions. And to achieve that kind of applying the service design techniques to really improve the, the experience you have when you work with Mozilla. Because in the past we haven't been really good about it and we're trying to uh, improve massively. And one project, and this is why you are here and I stopped talking now, <laughs> is uh, Common Voice, which is basically combining all of this. This is a result of uh, many open innovation techniques, many open innovation methods, and I think it's a result we can be quite proud of, and uh, that's thanks to these two guys, which I now hand over. Or? And this guy. And this guy. <laughs> three. Three. <laughs> many more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Yeah, as Alex is saying, we can't do this alone. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, that's how Mozilla, a small corporation, is, that's the only way that we are able to compete with uh, the large players in this space, is if we do this together as a team, with not just our corporation, but businesses, nonprofits, uh, NGOs, governments, as well as startups and universities. Uh, so that's why we do this in such an open way. And indeed, um, I also want to say thank you for listening to us speak in English. I know it's most of your, not your first language, and so we will try to uh, uh, talk clearly, but if we are not, don't hesitate to uh, raise your hand and say, slow down, or speak louder, or as we apologize. And my, uh, I have, uh, my Mandarin is very bad, and it's even worse uh, than my German, which I don't speak German, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for listening to us in English. Um, and if there are questions that uh, you would rather speak in, in Mandarin, um, we have some people that can help us and help translate and, and we will do our best to uh, answer the questions um, in a native way and we can uh, communicate uh, through go-between, so thank you. Okay, so before we talk about common voice and deep speech, uh, I want to talk a little bit about how voice assistants work so you can hear about what we are focusing on with these two projects. So we have this, uh, we've broken it down into five different pieces. Actually, we didn't break this down. Uh, Jerry Liu broke this down, and we, we are using his diagram. Um, but there are five steps of a modern voice assistant. First is the voice pickup. You speak into a microphone. Maybe it's a, a smart speaker, or your phone, or a computer. Um, and that records audio data. Then this audio data is turned into words, text. This is called speech recognition, or sometimes speech to text. That's step two. Step three is understanding the meaning of those words. What is the person trying to say? Is it a command, a question? Is it, are they trying to buy something on the internet? Um, this is often called natural language understanding. Sometimes it's called conversational AI. Uh, sometimes it's called intent parsing. But in any case, it's taking, extracting meaning from words. And then, the voice assistant or device will often perform some sort of action on the user's behalf, like search the web or buy something, uh, but it has to respond to you after that. So step four is generating natural language, so generating the text that it wants to say back to you. What is it going to say in words? And then it needs to speak that in a, in a way a human would. And so it needs to turn those words into actual vocal output, auditory output. This is called speech synthesis, or sometimes text-to-speech. That's step five. So this is the pipeline of how you would interact with the voice assistant today. And for tonight, we're going to focus on number two, speech recognition. That's what the technology that we are building right now in the open, and that's what we would love your help with. And you might ask yourself, well, why is Mozilla playing in this space? There are already many great devices out there, great services that can do speech recognition for you. A lot of these products and services are household names, right? You have Amazon Alexa, Apple Siri, OK Google, or Google Home. Um, but if you peel back the curtains of these devices, you'll find actually that speech recognition and voice assistance are powered by just a handful of very large and rich corporations. And you probably know all of them. But it's the right top one. This one here. Yeah. Yes, actually, you don't know this one. Yeah. Uh, but that's a very good question. So this, this is a company called Nuance. And this is 
probably the most powerful voice company that you've never heard of. They, they have a, um, so I should have said that now, but um, Nuance has a, a line of products um, that does voice recognition for enterprise. However, a lot of their money is made off of patent lawsuits in America for companies that violate their patents. So they, uh, they actually make a lot of money off voice recognition, but not through products, through litigation. Um, so that's, that's a whole other conversation. We won't focus on that tonight. Yes. <laughs> well, I don't. That's only my own. Yeah, exactly. I don't want to <laughs> take sides. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, these are all very powerful and, and rich corporations. And, and the reason why it's limited to only a handful of rich corporations playing in the space right now is because it's very expensive to build good speech recognition technology. And I'm going to tell you why now. First of all, being able to build speech technology, you need a team of machine learning scientists. Uh, machine learning scientists are not only very highly paid, they're very hard to find, because a lot of them already work for these, for these companies. But if you somehow manage to find them, you still need vast computational resources with highly specialized computer hardware. Um, sometimes in the order of magnitude of a sports car, in terms of a computer that would cost as much as a Ferrari, this is what you need to do just basic training with this data. And then if you somehow manage to get a hold of a sports car computer, you still have to collect a ton of vocal data. That's data with uh, what someone says and the transcription, or the words that they say, linked together. This data is really hard to find, and you need a lot of it on the order of 10,000 hours. Uh, so to give you a an idea of, of how much 10,000 hours is. How many people here have ever watched uh, a TED Talk? Does anyone know TED Talks? So TED Talks are uh, a speaker series that you can find on YouTube or other sites. And uh, there's a lot of them. Someone took all the TED Talks and put them together into a data set, and it only amounts to a couple of hundred hours of voice data. So you need orders of magnitude on top of, uh, of all the TED Talks ever to get to a single language. So that's a lot of data, right? And so if you somehow manage to hire this team of machine learning scientists, and you somehow manage to pay for a really expensive sports car computer, and you somehow manage to get 10,000 hours of data, you still have to build your product or your service or uh, your device to compete with these existing players who have not only a head start, but they also have, but they also have um, all the things we just mentioned and lots of money uh, to back that up. So we think that this has created a winner-take-all scenario that is stifling innovation in voice technology right now. And uh, this is preventing people like us, Mozilla, but also academics, hobbyists, startups, government agencies from taking part in this. If you want to build voice technology right now, you almost have to go to one of these services. And, and that's not really a choice. So that's why Mozilla is playing in the speech recognition space. We have two projects that we're going to introduce tonight that are both related and both taking part in number two, what we said earlier, speech recognition, speech to text. Project Deep Speech and Project Common Voice. To talk a little bit about this is the uh, head of machine learning at Mozilla, Kelly Davis. I'm Kelly Davis, uh, manager of the machine learning group at Mozilla. <clears throat> and I'm here to talk a bit today about Deep Speech, which is an open source speech recognition engine we're building. And we're also open sourcing the models uh, that go along with this engine. So, first, to frame things, I want to talk a little bit just about speech recognition to sort of get the groundwork set up. Speech recognition really of any type can be considered to consist of more or less these three phases. First, you talk into a particular microphone, like this one. The audio from your uh, from your sp spoken words are created sequence uh, to a sequence of ones and zeros. These ones and zeros are sent to a computer, which then computes on these ones and zeros. And the result of that computation is a transcript of the actual audio you initially put in. So it's basically a process like there's various different ways of doing speech recognition, but in particular today, I'm going to talk about a deep learning approach. Uh, deep learning is a branch of machine learning, 
um, which has as its sort of fundamental computational unit artificial neurons. Artificial neurons are based off, or motivated by, I should say, uh, neurons in the brain. Basically, do a very simple computation and come up with a very simple result. But you have lots of them doing this particular computation. So, what I'm going to be talking about today really is the intersection of uh, speech recognition, this field of study of speech recognition, and also deep learning, where these two fields meet. Um, so, in general, for creating a speech recognition engine, you require basically three different ingredients. You require an algorithm to actually learn how to do the speech recognition. You require compute to actually train the speech recognition engine on. It actually required data. So <clears throat> the data piece is really just, a, like Michael said, it's a set of pairs of audio, which person saying something, along with the transcript, i.e. the text of what they say. You have to have hours and hours, approximately 10,000 hours of this type of data to train a production quality speech recognition engine. By production quality, I mean something like what Google has really today. And that's, again, a lot of data. So first now I'm going to talk about uh, the algorithm for deep speech, our, our speech recognition engine. Uh, this is a, basically a diagram of our speech recognition engine. As I guess some of the people in the audience have done some machine learning, I'm going to try and go into a little bit of detail here. Well, hopefully not too much detail. <coughs> I guess the <coughs> probably most important thing about the speech recognition engine, in particular this speech recognition engine, <clears throat> is that it's easy to change languages. Um, that's one of the criteria we came up with when you're choosing a particular architecture and a particular algorithm we decided upon. <clears throat> By that I mean it's easy to go from, say, an engine that knows how to understand English to one that knows how to understand traditional Chinese Mandarin. <clears throat> so this algorithm is really based upon the algorithm we're using is based upon actually some work that Baidu did in 2014. Uh, and it's deep learning based, as I mentioned before. Uh, again, now a little technical detail. Uh, so the algorithm itself really makes it, the, the architecture itself is actually relatively simple from a, a deep learning point of view. You have audio, it gets fed in. This audio, we extract features from these audio. In particular, right now, we're using so-called MFCC features. Um, these features are fed through three feed-forward neural network layers, and then it's fed into a bidirectional recurrence neural network layer. After that, another feed-forward layer, and then also a softmax layer. The softmax layer is interesting in that it basically determines what characters output at each particular time tick. So, for example, at a particular time tick, it may say, okay, I think I'm hearing an A, or a B, or a C, or what have you. Then after that's what's called the CTC algorithm. Um, the CTC algorithm itself uh, basically solves what's called the alignment problem. Now, the alignment problem is this. I can say a particular sentence very quickly. I can say it very slowly. However, if I say the word quickly, quickly, I say the word quickly, really, very slowly. Both of these audios have the same transcript, the actual text, quickly. However, the audio, for when I say it slowly, is very long, and the audio, when I say it quickly, is very short. So there's a problem of aligning the audio with the actual text, and this is the alignment problem. This CTC algorithm, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but that essentially solves the alignment problem. Um, Older speech recognition engines, really, you have to do this a little bit more laboriously. This solves it just with training data. You give it data and it solves the alignment problem itself. So. Also, I should say, um, older speech recognition engines required more linguistic input. So, for example, they required things like mm, phonetic dictionaries. You had to know for a particular word what are the phonemes of this particular word. This doesn't require that. This particular architecture simply requires data. You require audio of someone saying something and an associated transcript, i.e. the text of what they're saying. So this is the algorithm we're using. I go in a little bit more detail than I normally do, but this is generally the algorithm we're using to actually do speech recognition. Um, 
Now I'll talk a little bit about the compute involved in machine training this. Um, naively, one might think uh, that one could train a speech recognition engine on just a normal computer, a laptop, let's say. And however, that's not the case. Actually, one needs a relatively powerful computer to actually train a speech recognition engine on. And I'll talk about, in particular, the setup we use to train our engine. What we have is five different computers. One of them is a head node. That basically has all our disk space where we store our training data. It has about 200 times the disk space of a MacBook Pro. It has 100 terabytes, actually. Uh, and we have four different worker nodes that actually do the work of training. Each one of these worker nodes has about 46 times the GPU strength of a new MacBook Pro, about 10 times the networking speed, about eight times uh, the RAM of MacBook Pro. So in a little bit more technical detail, um, it has eight GPUs. Each node, each one of these computers has eight GPUs, and each, each GPU has uh, 10 teraflops of compute. So in total, our whole system has about 350 teraflops. So, and to give you an idea how hard it is to train these models, <clears throat> this system, if we're training it on about 3,200 hours of data, takes about a week to train up a model. So, even with this relatively expensive machine, as he said, expensive, it's really as expensive as a sports car, about 150,000 US dollars. It'll take a week to train a model. So, the compute required is, is significant. And it turns out the case, one may think, why did we buy this computer to set it up? The case is that if you actually use, say, Amazon, at least when we bought it, if you use Amazon to train us to, to create a similar computer like AWS, um, <clears throat> you spend that much money in a month of running Amazon uh, continuously, you could buy this computer. So it basically pays for itself in a month. <laughs> so it makes sense to. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense to buy a machine. So that's what we're doing about it. Okay. Um, next, I'll talk about data and as a segue to common voice. Um, obtaining data to train on is really problematic. I mean, as, as Michael mentioned, <clears throat> it's to some extent easier for English to obtain data, but it's still hard. Um, so what we actually did initially, just because English is kind of the easiest thing to do first, is we got a data set together, and this data set consists of three different components. Here. Um, first, it's a switchboard corpus, a switchboard data set, and that's about 200 hours of data, and we actually have to buy this uh, from what's called the Linguistic Data Consortium. They're basically a group that sells different data sets. Another data set we uh, bought is the Fisher corpus. It's about 2,000 hours of data. And it's unfortunate that these are and the Fisher Corpus is really the biggest data set you can buy. I mean, you can't find a data set that's bigger than that. So you can't, even, even if you wanted to, you couldn't buy a data set that's around this 10,000 hour that you need. So we bought these two data sets. And also we use, which is, is the largest open source data set for English really right now, is the Libre Speech data set. And that's about 1,000 hours. <coughs> so altogether, this is about 3,200 hours of data. And this is what our, we are training our initial models on. Um, the problem then the is that uh, there's 3,200 hours of data. However, to get sort of these production level models, you need about 10,000 hours of data. So there's a, a breach. There's a difference of about that 7,000 hours that one needs, even for English, which is the easiest case. For languages outside of English, it's much, much, much worse for open data. Even for data that you can buy, it's much worse. Um, we saw a research paper just the other day that claimed <clears throat> it had the largest Mandarin data set that was open, and it was about 30 hours of data, which is nowhere near what you need. So the problem is really, it's bad for English, but it's much worse for any language outside of English. So as a result of this, and a result of seeing that there's a problem in the open source world for um, open data, I want to train a speech recognition engine on, we decided to introduce uh, Project Common Voice, uh, which is basically a way to collect and crowdsource data collection for speech recognition engines for us and for anyone else because we're creating these data sets in the open and for essentially the good of the world. And to talk about that a little bit more, I want to give Michael back the microphone. Talk about. Right. So.
Project Common Voice. Uh, first of all, thank you, Kelly. Uh, so this is exactly the type of machine learning scientist that is impossible to hire. <laughs> Mozilla is very lucky. Uh, Kelly. Yeah, so Common Voice, um, it's really the manifestation of all the things Alex talked about earlier. Our open innovation approach to how we solve problems. We identify the need within Mozilla, uh, specifically the speech recognition group for collecting a lot of data. And we thought, well, we are going to need to embrace open practices to do this. And while we're doing it, we should make this a public project so that we are working together rather than working for ourselves. This is actually part of the vision for this project, which was initially came up with uh, by Kelly Davis. So I want to talk a little bit about that approach. Of course, we're going to need to do crowdsourcing for Common Voice because we not only need a lot of data, we need a lot of individuals speaking this data. The more people who, who give their voice, who donate their voice to this project, the more robust the engine will be, the more people that will be able to understand that we actually create products from this, from this uh, product. And we also can't do this by ourselves, not just in terms of us embracing our community, but also we want to work with other organizations that include corporate, both startups as well as the big corporations, but also non-government organizations, government organizations, academic organizations, any sort of group of people who are interested in collecting this data and want to help, we will work with them. And then of course, kind of Mozilla's uh, bread and butter, our, our core competency and our core values is working with a community of individuals like yourself who can help us uh, achieve the things that we need to achieve because as, as we have said, we cannot do this ourselves. And of course, open source software is at the heart of what we do. Firefox, kind of our flagship product, which is an internet browser. This was an open source project from its very beginning, from its inception, uh, nearly, what, 15, 20 years ago? Long time, before I was born. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 17 now, so. <laughs> okay. So where are we now? We launched this project in July 2017. Since then, we've collected 900 hours of English voice data from 112 different countries. This 112 countries is an important metric because not only do we need a lot of people, but we need a diverse amount of accents, of ways of speaking, because we want to be able to understand anybody and how they speak. Um, and for English particularly, there are people from all over the world who speak English in very different ways. And it could be your native language or your second language, but regardless, you may speak English in a different way. And to that point, you may have seen some videos on YouTube where a Scottish person tries to interact with a voice assistant, and uh, it doesn't go very well, as you might imagine. And also, uh, I don't have this number up here, but the data set is comprised of about 25,000 different people right now. So a, a large amount of people have decided to donate their voice. Even more have helped us curate this data set, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Soon, uh, so right now, Common Voice, the data set, is the second largest open source speech data set that exists for English. And we think that there aren't many in other languages as well. Uh, this year, if we continue at the current rate that we are, in fact, our rate is increasing, we will be the largest data set uh, that exists in the world. Um, and, but English is just the beginning, as we said. Uh, we want to create open and inclusive technology, and so we are reaching out into more languages, which you might know about. Uh, and indeed, we are collecting 15 different languages right now, including the big ones like French, German, traditional Chinese Mandarin, of course, and then smaller languages, uh, which you may or may not heard of, like Welsh, Chubish, Breton, Kyrgyz, uh, Kabyl, Languages that I had never heard of even before I started working on this project. And we're, we're um, collecting, we have 60 more in progress, or more than 60 more in progress, and indeed we add languages to this all the time. You see, common voice to us is not our method for collecting voice data for, say, Firefox or any of our products. What we see common voice as is a toolkit for communities like you to create and build open speech technology. And so 
wherever this community exists who wants to create this technology, we will help you create that with uh, infrastructure, hosting, pipelines of data. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, we aren't doing this alone. We are collaborating very closely with these companies. Mycroft is an open source alternative to Amazon's Alexa. It's a privacy-centric one. I, I definitely recommend checking it out. Snips.ai is a business-to-business -business, uh, product for consumer or for voice recognition. And then universities like Bangor University in Wales, who have been doing a lot of work for preserving language, um, Celtic languages, which are considered under-resourced. So a whole different use case for this voice data, besides just speech recognition, is preserving language and culture. And, and we want to support those uses as well. To give you an idea of where the data is right now, we just launched um, collecting multiple languages in June, June 7th to be exact. And since then, uh, it's a modest start, but it's actually a pretty good start. We have 50 hours of, of French and German. Uh, we actually don't know of bigger data sets that exist right now in French and German. And traditional Chinese. Um, you'll notice that tra traditional Chinese is smaller than French and German. But actually, traditional Chinese just started uh, a couple weeks ago. So traditional Chinese, and Mandarin specifically, is collecting a lot faster than any of these languages here. We expect it to be the second biggest data set very soon, and uh, maybe the biggest data set. OK, so how does it work? If you haven't seen it, it's just a website. That's our core competency, web, web stuff. Go to voice.mozilla.org, and you can see this both on your mobile phone as well as your desktop. Um, if you have an iOS device, we don't support mobile Safari right now, so we do have an iOS app, but it's the same exact experience. There are three parts. This is first, the first part, recording your voice. You go to the website or the app, and you push this button, and you read the sentence into, into the, your phone, your computer, your desktop. Uh, and, and we record this. Second step is listening. You, will, you can also listen to other recordings and verify if what they said actually matches the text that's on the screen. This is an important part of the data set collection process because we have to verify or validate that all of the data we are giving the speech engines, like DeepSpeech, is accurate because we want the resulting voice assistant to be as accurate as possible. So we are also using your help to curate the data set. And then, at the end of the day, we package all of this data up, we put it in a nice zip archive, and we have a, a download button where you can get it. And we have uh, formatted the data in a format that many people use to train speech technology. What's next for Common Voice, what we're working on now, uh, is a couple things. But the largest goal that we have, besides collecting more languages, is to get increase the rate with which we are collecting data. As part of that, we want to make the website a lot more fun and rewarding to interact with. So our, our big milestones coming up in the next few months are around exposing metrics on the site so you can see how fast we are, collect we are collecting data for the various languages and the various communities. So we want to expose as much as we can. We will have uh, graphs that are, that are changeable by language so you can see how fast you're going. You can set daily goals for yourself. You can have a calendar of how you have uh, contributed so you can see, you know, oh, I contribute on Wednesdays and Thursdays. Maybe I should contribute on Tuesdays. And then we'll also have ways to share and re-engage uh, back through the site, because we want to make it so far, and this is thanks to the design work we've done, and we, we did in Taipei last year, we understood that we needed to tell the story of Common Voice with the website. I think we had done that, but now all we have is, is people who are donating their voice for altruistic reasons. reasons. They do it because they want to feel good, and they want to take part in this movement. But we also want to make it fun. So our next step is, let's make this fun. And let's ex let's do some things that maybe you would want to donate, even if you didn't care about the voice data. OK, so we haven't done this yet on this machine. But we're going to try to do uh, a little bit of a demo of what the website uh, does. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so I just go to voice.mozilla.org. This is the website. By default, it's in English because my browser's language is English. But if you, if many of you were to go here, I bet it would choose uh, traditional Chinese first. But I'm just going to switch to traditional Chinese. And then we'll go to the contribution portal. <laughs> Why was that one? <laughs> <laughs> this one. Um, oh, this? Yeah. Wait, what this is, is one dish of me, very dish. Ah, which one is that? Just one picture. Didn't you write this though? No. Uh, <laughs> I did from the novel. Uh -huh, okay. About the donating. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, let's, this is the speak portal. Let's start with listen. Um, so, this is a sentence that someone else has read, and I will read it out now. Uh -oh. No, oh. All right, I'm voting that no. <laughs> All right, let's listen to this one. Yes, yes no? That's good, yeah, good. Yeah. How many vote yes? Yeah. How many vote no? Oh, there's some no's. Okay, I'm going to no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to actually do it. Um, would anyone like to come up and uh, donate, record their voice? Really fun. <laughs> 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 he does so much for us already. download the voice data. Like I said, now it's all in English. Very soon we will release um, the multi-language, which will include traditional Chinese Mandarin. And we hope to do so by the end of the year. We want to get to a, a good place where we have uh, enough data that is useful. Uh, but we think uh, given the current rate of collection and the increasing rate of collection, we believe that by the end of 2018 we'll have something to give, give back and show you. We also uh, are linked to other popular open source data um, data collections so that you can use them for your purposes as well. As we hope with the website, we're not just creating a data set uh, for you to train on, but also having a place where you can go like a one-stop shop for all of your voice data needs. That's what we're trying to create here. So we have other places uh, to download. This now, okay. But yeah, that is... I think that's the end. Okay, we have this Q&A, which I'll put up in a second. Before I do that, I just want to call out that we also have Telegram groups um, and a line chat if you would like to join and uh, contribute your voice or contribute your thoughts or your ideas. This is where we kind of synchronize community efforts. Thanks to Urban. I just created last night, so <laughs> we will begin soon. Yes, <laughs> tonight. Yeah. Yeah. One question, is it free to join? Yeah, of course. Anybody? Okay. Yeah. But you could pay me if you like. <laughs> <laughs> There's a donation button on the Mozilla site. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Mozilla does accept donations, but yes, it's all, it is free. And, and, oh, I forgot to mention, the data that we publish, it's licensed with CC0. And so if you're not a licensed aficionado, this means Creative Commons level zero, which means pure public domain. Uh, you do not have to credit us. You do not have to, you can use it for commercial or non-commercial purposes. We hope that this, this data will have the most impact possible. And so we, we keep it restriction free. It's public domain. And I already see people joining the group, which is great. Okay, so let's go back here and I need the slides.
Thank you, Jason, for your help. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, since I'm today's photographer, so I have uh, Larry to help. As, uh, <laughs> oh, as, uh, okay. Okay. So we are going to the questions. Sit here or just stand here. <laughs> 那個我們在那個上面在這個板上有幾個問題啊,各位如果在現場如果有想問問題的maybe可以先舉手。沒有的話我們就OK,let's okay, maybe uh start with this,OK. Okay. Good idea. I think the first there are several question uh regarding to Taiwan in uh uh right now I think you already connected the uh, 36 hours uh, of uh, uh Taiwan language do you have any plan to uh, do the dialect in the Taiwan, like the local language of, of Taiwan? And yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a great question. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier about Common Voice, we don't see it as a toolkit for Mozilla to go out and collect particular data sets with languages, dialects, ways of writing, and ways of speaking. Uh, we, we consider Common Voice a toolkit, Common Voice and Deep Speech a toolkit for communities to build up this data set and build speech technology whenever they would like or, or wherever they are in the world and whatever they speak. And so absolutely we are interested in collecting multiple dialects that are spoken here in Taiwan, like Hakka and Hakien and uh, the many indigenous languages. We are, we are certainly, um, we would love to help with that, uh, with that effort. That said, we as Mozilla, we don't actively go out. What we do is we support. So if there are members of the audience tonight who are interested in this, we can help you get involved so that we can spin up a version of Common Voice in whatever language or dialect that you're interested in. And we will give you support as you uh, do the things that you need to do. There's two big steps for launching Common Voice in your language. One, right, we need to translate or localize the website, which we have some great tools and a great community. Uh, Mozilla is actually really lucky in this way, we have a very vibrant localization community and we can get you introduced into that. That's step one. And then step two, we need sentences in this language for people to read so that we can uh, link the voice data with the what was said, right, the transcription. So sentence collection and the localization of the website are the two steps. If you're interested in bringing Common Voice to a new language, we can help you do that either tonight or in the future um, through the, the channels that we shared earlier. And the nice thing is, the way deep speech works, as Kelly was saying, using deep learning, we don't actually need to know anything about how the language works, because if we feed it enough data, a lot of data, but if we feed it enough, then deep learning can figure out any language. Um, am I right in saying that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, so we, indeed we are interested. Okay, uh, follow on your answer, there is uh, one more question. Uh, about that, the uh, how will Taiwan's company to benefit from your data or even from your results? Right. Yeah. So, so not just Taiwanese companies. We do hope to encourage startups mm -hmm. as well as uh, companies in this space, uh, but also academic institutions, uh, government institutions, and nonprofits. We hope to help all of them. And the question was, how will this help? What this, what Common Voice can do is collect a critical mass of this data so that it can be fed into a machine learning algorithm like deep speech and create speech to text technology, so speech recognition. So imagine if I spoke, if I wanted to speak Taiwanese to my voice assistant or my email client or my phone, but it didn't work so well, this is what we want to create. And if you were wanted to create, for instance, a teaching product that used speech recognition to teach uh, children who spoke Mandarin to speak Taiwanese or vice versa, then this data, the deep speech technology, are useful components in building that technology. And in fact, you don't need to use deep speech and common voice together. They do work very well together because we have set them up to do it, but you could use just the data if you wanted to in your own speech technology. Or you could use just deep speech with your own data if you had your own private data that you couldn't share to the public. So we see these, these tools as components that you can use to build products, and they are open <coughs> products. They are licensed with an open license, and you can use them both commercially or non-commercially. And, and also you can use the data 
also you can use the data in any way because it's CC0 in public domain. So you, you are not forced to use the data in artificial intelligence or training the models. You can use the data to like creating the games or like building a system that can uh, like speak like a human or like anything. So you can, the data is actually, there's not any limit on the data. So, yeah, use the imagination. Yeah, I would, I would love to see like a movie or a, a radio show <laughs> comprised of this data with just 10,000 different people saying the lines of the movie. That would be Whoa. interesting. So, yes, however you want. Okay, you yes, a question about the data quality. You just have a yes and no to ensure the data quality. And uh, besides that, is there any other uh, ways to ensure that? And also, that uh, do you care about to label the uh, Speakers sex or the children ASIN? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Can you hold this for a second? <laughs> we also have oh, you show. Yeah. We really need some voice control firebox. Yeah, we do. <laughs> it's oh, wait, we're actually working. Uh, we do have ways to to report um, certain metadata about users. Um, of course, right now we only have a few points of metadata, and I think we would love to have more. But we, we have ways of reporting age, as well as sex, um, as well as accent. Although accent for uh, traditional Chinese Mandarin is, is a little bit complex, and we're still working on that. Um, and this would be something we will continue to work on. But absolutely. We need to collect uh, metadata about this so that we can build speech technology that targets individual groups, right? If you were a startup and you wanted to build learning software, you would probably target children or the elderly. And then the question came up earlier, um, well, can I use this technology for children? You can, however, uh, right now, the Common Voice website is not targeting uh, children specifically. And in fact, in our terms of service, if you are under the age of 18, need to have parents supervision. I think at some point we will think about a product like Common Voice, uh, and maybe Common Voice itself, but a different version that would go out to children. Uh, but we would ha we have a lot to think about in terms of uh, user consent and privacy, and the laws are very different for different nations. So for now, we are not focusing on children voice data. Uh, but, but certainly, at some point, we will look at this. And then on the other spectrum of that, uh, for the elderly, absolutely, we are we are looking for elderly data, and so anything above uh, a certain age, we hope to be able to segment, and that you could grab just that data and trade with that data, fine tune on that data. Uh, so yes, so yes, we are trying to collect more metadata, and there will be changes coming up soon, where you'll be able to report that you speak multiple languages, that one language is your native language, and you can contribute in multiple languages. Just because I think most of you here are multilingual, um, unlike myself, which is very sad. But you can speak English as well as probably Mandarin. Uh, and so you could donate your voice in both. And indeed, both versions of your voice are, both languages with your voice are very important because we need to be able to recognize everyone in the way that they speak. When you open your data, this kind of attribute will come with the voice. OK, so ask. Labels. Yes, these will be these parts here come with the data. Um, these parts here do not. So we anonymize the, the data set so that uh, not only can you not uh, attribute a voice to your email address, of course, but also we do not group individuals. So it is all one big bucket of data when you download it. So you, you couldn't, for instance, use it for speaker identification because we do not group by speaker for privacy reasons. I think there was a question here that we didn't cover. Uh, maybe this is one for you. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess I could. I'll talk in particular. There's some. I think there's several things I hear really want to talk about now. Um, this question in particular is asking about machine translation. We are starting work on machine translation, I should say, or 
we're applying for funding to start work on machine translation. What we're doing basically is we have uh, funded Edinburgh Youth University to create a parallel corpora. And that basically means what they've done is they've crawled the web and found a bunch of translations. So they have maybe a German sentence paired with an English sentence or a Spanish sentence paired with a German sentence. And there's a data sets they've gotten of parallel text. And they've done that through our initial funding of maybe a year and something ago. And to further on this work, we've now applied for EU funding to work with Edinburgh, Edinburgh University and a few other universities to actually create what's called neural machine translation machine learning model. That's basically a way of a model, an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm that can actually translate from this data we actually collected earlier <coughs> from one language to another. The hope is that if we get this funding, we can uh, integrate this uh, machine translation model into Firefox within I guess, uh, two and a half to three years. So that's, in terms of machine translation, that's one thing uh, we're working on. Um, another thing we're working on is actually the reverse of speech recognition, which is text-to-speech. We just started at the beginning of this year actually creating a text-to-speech model, and it's still being worked on. It's still sort of early going for the text-to-speech model. And who are planning on doing there again, as we release everything open source, it's even now in the open with the Mozilla public license. Um, what we're planning on doing with that is one, releasing open models so people can actually use text to speech wherever they want to use it for whatever purpose they see fit. And also, we're planning on integrating this text to speech model into Firefox. That's just one of the, say, problems, I'd say, or lack of features that Firefox has. It doesn't have a text to speech engine built into it tends to use the text-to-speech engine that's native to the OS that happens to be on. So that's another plan we're doing with text-to-speech. Um, another thing we're also working on is what's called uh, automatic summarization. Uh, Firefox really right now has integrated into it Pocket, which is basically a basic service to allow people to pocket, i.e. save different web pages. And they have their own personal set of web pages they save. What's often the case is that one wants to from this personal cache of web pages, one wants a quick summary of a particular web page uh, before they go into detail reading it. Uh, what we're working on now is um, some machine learning algorithms that allow one that basically are able to read a particular page and then create a small summary of the page. So it sort of is more or less kind of abstracting a particular page. So you can give it a long multi-page document; it will read that document and come up with a one or two sentence summary. Of so that's another thing we're working on in terms of um, automatic summarization. Um, one other thing we're working on for with Deep Speech too is uh, since creating Deep Speech are architecturing Deep Speech in a slightly different way, so it's able to run on small platform devices. By this I mean it's able to run on say something like a phone. It doesn't you don't require a server to do the speech to text uh, translation. So it can run in your phone if you're not connected to the internet or it could run on something as small as a Raspberry Pi. And we're working with deep speech and actually making the, arch making the architecture itself smaller and doing some tricks, let's say, with the, with the architecture to make it work on small platform devices like Raspberry Pis. There's probably other things I'm forgetting that we're also working on too, but those are sort of the major things that come to mind.
there are, you know, if you are someone who is serious about using machine learning and Mozilla technology in your company or organization, uh, we will we will talk directly to you, and, and that's a much better. It's the only way we can do it right now because our tooling is still in its early days, and so we uh, we must evolve it with the group, with the community, in, in true open innovation action. Uh, there's a, a discourse. Yeah. There's a Mozilla discourse, which is a, is a forum um, website. It's this Mozilla Dark community, I think. Yeah, and there's a common voice uh, board on the discourse that you can share and uh, discuss it together. Yeah, discourse.mozilla.org slash c slash voice. Okay. Yeah. yeah, discourse. Also, a deep oh, yeah, yeah, also deep So, this is the machine learning aspect. Yeah, so you can find the people who are interested in the project and who are contribu contributing to the project uh, around the world on the discourse and on the Telegram group and on the uh, now online groups. Okay. Okay, so, the next uh, question is asking about when the data to be Yeah, um, the limiting factor of us releasing this is the uh, amount of time we have to work on it. We, whenever we launch data or publish data, it requires us to do some processing of this data, specifically to anonymize the data and put it into a format that speech recognition engines would like to accept. To give you a little detail, uh, engines expect to be able to train on a certain portion of this, of this data set, but then also test the results on a totally different portion of this data set. And this split uh, takes a little bit of time. And currently our team is very small, it's only a handful of people. You would be surprised how few people are actually working on this. And uh, as I said earlier, our big effort right now is around making the website more fun. And so we are going to focus on those website features that we talked about earlier first through the end of September, maybe early October, and then in early October, switch over to processing and publishing the data set. Uh, so we hope to, in November or early December, publish the multi-language version of the data set, which will include traditional Chinese and Mandarin, as well as German, as well as French, as well as a handful of other languages, and then also, of course, an update to our English data set. So, Again, uh, December would be a, a, is what we are targeting right now. Okay, so next is the maybe uh, talking about that there is a, a white noise that's uh, in the, when you're using the microphone and uh, how to deal with it. Strangely enough, okay, the question is how do we deal with white noise with mic when in microphones when recording? Um, strangely, the answer is is actually having this noise is good. <laughs> Um, it's actually, the, the, the problem is that when you train a system, when you train a speech recognition system, and it, the speech recognition system is used in the wild, say it's used on a phone, or used when someone is in a car, or used when someone is walking on the street, the microphone that's going to be used on isn't going to be perfect. It's going to be noise in the microphone, there's going to be cars noise, it's going to be train noise, there's going to be a whole bunch of things like that. To train the speech recognition system to be able to deal with these background noises or white noises or things like this, we have to give it training data that has these white noise in it or has background noise in it, has other, these other sort of imperfections in the actual data set you train on. So having these imperfections, having this noise in the background or white noise or what have you in the background or in the actual data for common voice is actually good. I mean, it, it, when you train a system with this noisy data, the system will learn how to deal with this noisy data and learn how to, in the wild, actually do text, I mean, speech to text with background noise. It's, it's a good thing. Yeah, I think that we need to do some script on the trends or on the <laughs> airplanes or, yeah. Come on, voice script. Everybody record your sons in, in your car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, next Because the 
you know that the voice will be have the near far or far field yeah. option. So do you have option? So support one? We currently don't. It's interesting though. I mean, it's kind of we don't, but I would okay, it would be slightly technical now. We don't, but I would assume the distribution of distances that one records with is similar to the distribution that it will uh, encounter in the wild. So we don't have an option for that, but I would guess there's a variation of different distances that people record at, and I'd guess that this variation would be similar to what one would have when actually the speech recognition engine is in the wild, but that's a very interesting point because also as a second follow-on to that, um, it could be the case that Common Voice, for example, isn't going to be recording right now with, let's say, very far field data because it's really geared towards the website. So it's the person's going to have the phone here or the laptop there. So it's going to be maybe maximum one meter. It's not going to be, say, three or four meters, which is more common for something like Alexa. However, I should say also there's a, I guess Michael mentioned there's another company, Mycroft, that we're working with. They have an open source. Alexa competitor, for lack of a better term. They are letting us use some of their, their training data, not for Common Voice, but actually train our speech recognition engine. And this is this data really has people yelling across their room to their devices. So we'll have some training data, but not a part of the Common Voice, but we'll have some training data, which has this very, very far field, like two or three meter distance that people are sort of yelling to these devices. So we'll have some data that has that characteristic for the deep speech models, but for common voice, because of legal reasons, we can't put it in the common voice data. So hopefully, answer some of the questions. <laughs> okay. So the next question, I'm not sure of that, but I understand it. Is language a good way to categorize speech? Yeah, I say. Okay. Ask the question. Is there a question? 我猜他的意思可能是说，就是我们把资料最后分成各种不同的语言，是不是一个好方法？我猜是这样。Yeah, I guess that the question is that uh, when we release the data, we release the data in different data set with different language, and then is it a good way or we can categorize the data in many different ways? I can partially answer that, but I, I it's an interesting question. I mean, rephrase that way. I'd say, <clears throat> to some extent, I'm looking at it from a speech recognition point of view. Uh, say, for example, if we're having a speech data set that has English in it and a speech data set that has German in it. Um, for speech recognition engine, uh, it has to output particular <coughs> characters. Say, uh, the English, American English character set is like A, B, C, D, D, D to Z. But the German character set has extra letters in it. So if we were to train a speech recognition engine with <coughs> English and German data, the output character set would have to be the sum or the union, I'd say, of the two different character sets. So it would have to be all the English normal English characters plus the three or so extra German characters. And a similar thing would be true if you put more and more languages in. It would, the character set that you'd have to output for the speech recognition would be more and more complicated. And another thing which comes in, this is also from a speech recognition point of view, there are what's called, which I didn't talk about, which is, uh, is what's called a language model, which is integrated into the speech recognition engine. A language model is basically a way of determining how common various sentences are in a language. So it may say, look at a particular sentence and say, OK, that's a very common sentence. I say it's a really, it looks like an English sentence to me. Or it might say, oh, that doesn't really look very Englishy to me. This series of words won't re wouldn't really appear in English. <clears throat> to create a language model, one has to have a lot of text in a particular language. So one has to have a lot of English text. And from this group of English texts, one can learn a language, a language model. What I, we haven't done, but might be possible, is to create a language model that sort of encompasses two different languages. I haven't seen people doing this, but one would if one would have to train over these multi-language data sets, one would have to create a multi-language language model. I haven't seen people doing that, and I would guess it's probably be hard to make the whole system work correctly, but it's an interesting thing, especially also interesting where it happens often in Germany now that 
people will import, I guess it happens here too, people will import uh, certain words from other languages. And that's also going to be an interesting thing to deal with. I mean, if you're dealing with pure German, it's kind of, you don't have to think about it, but if you're dealing with sort of the way German is spoken, for example, today on the street, people have to use a lot of English words in German. And that, I agree, that's sort of one thing that has to be dealt with. But as to putting the entire German data set with the entire English set, that's sort of a slightly different level up in terms of mixing data sets. Uh, but it's an interesting question. I, I haven't seen really people do much research on multilingual speech recognition engines, but it'd be interesting to try. Okay. In the, in the current uh, traditional Chinese data sets, we, I also put, I only put the Chinese characters, the Chinese sentence in the, in the data sets with a little numbers, which is also represented in Chinese characters. And there's just very, very, very few English words in the in the current data set. That yeah, it's, that's a question. That, uh, should we just uh, add English words that people are talking that like, randomly about into the data set, or yeah, we should we should just put anything in Chinese. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Do you do you think that we we should? I mean. If I'm being honest, probably the most useful thing to do would be to include sentences there which are the way people speak today, which would include English. I mean, because that would that's you want them you want to train a speech recognition engine yeah. that can work in the real world as yeah. opposed to some theoretical world which doesn't exist. Yeah. So. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So actually, these two. Questions from me. I think I got the, the, the first one in your presentation, and you already uh, mentioned about the uh, machine learning. And uh, I actually, I, I want to jump into this. It, it, it seems uh, we try to liberalize this uh, technology. But in the world, there are so many technology need to be liberalized. Why this voice matters? Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, let's see. Can you So I actually have a slide for this. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks for the question. <laughs> thanks, thanks, yeah. yeah, I'll pay you later for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, Mozilla, it looks like Mozilla is trying to free voice technology, make it more open and inclusive and accessible. But why? What, what is the goal? Why is, why is speech technology so important? Um, well, if I look back at Mozilla and why we exist, we believe in a free and open internet because we believe a free and open internet provides equality of information, of access to information uh, across the world, or at least has the potential to do so. And this equality of access to information is so important for providing not just services, but also the way people think, philosophies, communication. The world is a better place when they can talk to each other and communicate, and as a, uh, I think this is uh, Audrey Tang, or, or I'm going to say it wrong, Tung Fo, uh, she believes that the internet provides uh, rough consensus building, participation, and radical transparency. And she tries to do, the, do this within the government, and we think the internet uh, has a lot of these similar concepts. And so if we uh, take these, this philosophy and apply it to voice, Voice technology has an incredible potential for providing access to information for people across the globe. And it's not just people who are on the go who want more convenient technology, like being able to order dog food on Amazon for, while they're in the bathroom, but also for people who want to learn a new language. Or let's say you have problems using a keyboard or a mouse, voice technology can help. Or if you have problems reading or problems with looking at the screen for long periods of time. Voice technology can help. Or uh, elderly populations or children who maybe we learn how to speak before we learn how to read. It's much easier to use your voice. And then there are large parts of the world where people never learn to read. Like take a language like Urdu, which actually has more speakers than German. A lot of people who speak Urdu cannot read and have no access to technology, no access to the internet. 
And so voice technology has the potential to unlock access to information like the internet and to all of these groups who have never had access to technology before. So there, not just is there a credible business potential, which we, which we love. We love products and services. We love convenience. We love uh, usable, fun interactions. But we also want to spread access to information. And that's why we think voice is really important. Your slides only have one slide. <laughs> 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 You've seen the oh wait, hold on. Just the cover. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a bad picture. Don't sorts of data besides voice, you're saying? Um, so far, well, that's a good question. And, I, and I, I will say, no, that's not what we're focused on right now. We're focused very narrowly on voice data and transcriptions. However, if I were to be able to work on this for um, a few years from now, and Common Voice creates usable voice data sets in many languages, I would love if the next iteration of this is um, a way, a, a platform for communities to curate data sets for machine learning. Uh, and it would be great, you know, we have these incredible technologies for managing code, uh, source code across all the world, right? We have Git, which is version control. We have GitHub, which is a social website that uses version control to have people collaborate. Um, can we, how might we, as Mozilla, create a platform like GitHub, but for curating data sets? Um, and so, I think down the road, we could consider Common Voice in an experiment in a GitHub for data. And then maybe, uh, if we are to, uh, if this proves successful, we can apply this, this methodology to other sorts of curation. So yes, um, it's a good idea, uh, but no, we're not, we not focusing on it. And you mentioned uh, this word crowdfunding. I just want to talk about that for a second, because there's a difference between crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. And uh, crowdfunding is uh, a lot of times what, what people call uh, microtasks, or you might have heard of this platform called Mechanical Turk. Uh, if you haven't heard of Mechanical Turk, it's a website where you can go to, uh, it's hosted by Amazon, where you, you can get paid to, to do little tasks. Um, so you might go to the website and it tells you, hey, if you can find the email address of this CEO from this website, we will pay you five cents or, you know, 10 time, time on these dollars. Um, and you do these tasks over and over and over again. And in fact, we've experimented with Mechanical Turk, uh, a crowdfunding approach for getting common voice data. However, uh, a lot of these platforms are very regional centric. So for instance, Mechanical Turk, which is the biggest one we know, is very North American centric. And you know, we want to be inclusive technology, so it won't work for the goals we're trying to accomplish. And yes, there are other platforms, like Indonesia, it's very popular to have uh, mechanical Turk-like apps on your phone, people make money that way, uh, but we, uh, it's, it's a very messy process for us, and so we wanted to, to keep it centralized. And then, for those of you who are into cryptocurrencies, there are, there are some ideas bouncing around, which I am very resistant to so far, uh, around creating a coin for, for voice, so people can, can talk to uh, Common Voice in exchange for tokens. Um, we've had ideas around this. I, I think that, for now, we're not exploring it, but certainly, at some point, we should look into other, other ways to incentivize people beyond just saying, hey, this is a great thing you're creating and you're doing for the world. Um, but, but for now, it's, it's working as a kind of community project, and we'd love to see it grow like that. My other question is about With other, oh, uh, maybe this is for, are you talking about from collecting point or for speech recognition point? Uh, yeah. Um, one of the things now is we just started collecting in, in outside of English. 
So in the models we created really right now are only in English. What we can do, they actually use, let's say a branch of machine learning or a technique of machine learning called transfer learning, which basically allows you to transfer knowledge from one, you learn from one bigger data set to a, a second smaller data set. So an easy example of that would be something like if we have a larger data set of American English and we have a smaller data set of Australian English. And we can take the model we create from the larger data set of American English and transfer it to, say, a smaller model that's actually both a model that's trained on a smaller data set to deal with Australian English. You can also do similar things uh, with different languages. So if I have a, one language that may be related to another, so like something like Afrikaans and Dutch. So say if we had a, a large data set of Dutch and a smaller data set of Afrikaans, you can do transfer learning to transfer knowledge trained, used from your trained model for Dutch to a, a model that you sort of fine tune to some extent on Afrikaans. There's definitely ways of doing this. And actually we just, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, got uh, funding from um, NSF, which is the National Science Foundation in America, to actually pursue this transfer learning for low resource languages, i.e. languages with not a lot of data. So it's to some extent a research question in a way, but also we're starting research, I guess, in the grant starts in about a few weeks to start doing this research on, on this transfer, using transfer learning to use the larger data sets to learn about and create speech recognition engine models for these smaller languages with smaller data sets. Um, what's interesting about that really right now is because we're just starting to collect in, in other languages, right now we have a lot more English data than any other data set. So the large data set really right now is English, but all the other languages really right now are much smaller data sets. So it's interesting also to consider even something like French, which is a relatively popular language. Because we don't have much French data set data, we can kind of view using English and the French data set together. The French data could be thought as, at least for now, a low resource language, just in our data set. So we can use some of these techniques to even start building models in other languages outside outside of English, using the larger English data set. They have no idea what's happening behind me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, I mean, what one can do is sort of, as I mentioned with the Afrikaans example, one can find languages that are kind of closely related. And hopefully some of the knowledge in these closely related languages, you can look at one that may have a bigger data set and the one that has a smaller data set and kind of transfer this knowledge between the two. But again, I mentioned this is, research you know what I mean? So it isn't sort of a, oh, you just turn the switch, this research paper says you do that, and it works 100% of the time. There's some research involved in how to actually use for our particular use case. I hope that answers your question. Is that implementation or, uh, uh, or, for example, you, you, you're talking about fine-tuning. Yeah, it, it is in a way fine-tuning. I mean, there have definitely be limitations as to the details of limitations. I have to say that. Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, uh, maybe you you're a bit better. I guess are there limitations to how transfer learning can be applied to uh, transfer knowledge from one language to another? That gets it. I, I have one idea. How about the bilingual voice data set? Yeah, that's actually one of the ideas we're actually pursuing under this NSF grant. What we're trying to do is, if we, well, okay. In terms of the, the actual speech recognition model we have for there right now, this, the diagram I put up there earlier, the output of it is essentially what's called the softmax layer. And that's basically, for our case, it's outputting, for each time tick, outputting letters that it thinks happens at this at this particular time tick. What we're thinking of doing is essentially having two different output softmax, one for, say, say if we're doing German and English, one for English and one for German, and then creating a larger data set that has German and English, and then at each particular sort of output, we could sort of say, okay, this is the, it's the batch right we're working on now, we're training on now is a German batch, so it has to output to this particular softmax layer, and it's an English particular sentence in this particular batch of data we're working on, so it has, has to output for the, the softmax layer of the English set, but the 
bulk, the bulk of the model will really be the same for both English and German. And we're hoping that it, this bulk of the model can actually learn sort of the commonalities of these two different languages. So we can kind of have a bilingual data set and then also from the bilingual data set, learn the sort of commonalities in the bulk of the model from, from the combined data set but also be able to output, say, in English or German, dependent upon whatever the sentence is in input. That's part of the research we're doing. But it, in terms of will that work 100% of the time, I honestly don't know. Uh, one feasible way, I think, is from the voice recording. We, we have a lot of bilingual people that can speak two languages in the world. There are many people that can speak at least two languages. So we can use this. Is, uh, uh, cloud sourcing has same sentence with two language speech. I don't know. I don't think it should matter too much if the same person says the sentence. I think because we want the system itself to be kind of independent of speaker independent, i.e. if I say a sentence to it, it can understand it. If you say a sentence to it, it can understand it. If he says a, says a sentence to it, it can understand it. So I think probably at least how I'm thinking of it, probably the most important thing is to have the core of the model be able to extract features which are relevant to both languages. And that's this double-headed approach kind of should do that in some way. I mean, one of the interesting things too, we're thinking of very certain ideas, there's maybe ways we're thinking also about using kind of unlabeled data in a particular language. So say for example, if we have um, Welsh, where we have maybe not a whole bunch of data, maybe 20 hours of data, something like this, 20 hours of labeled data. So we have audio clip along with the transcript for Welsh, but that's really not enough to train anything. So the question is, could we use, say, just Welsh unlabeled data? So we have maybe a thousand hours of Welsh that isn't doesn't have any transcript at all. Could we actually use that to sort of initialize the whole model to a good state and then essentially take this smaller data set of 20, 20 hours of Welsh to actually say fine tune the model to actually understand Welsh. That's also another thing we're pursuing. But I mean, these are, I, none of these are guaranteed to work. <laughs> it's researching, I'd say. Okay, maybe you could answer this uh, question. What if some language doesn't, doesn't come with text, doesn't come with any written text? Yeah, you cannot read writing language. Yeah. Text to speech for that? No. Yeah. For some languages that don't have words, don't exactly. have text. Okay. So for most languages. Yeah. Then how do we connect it then, or do we like with small words? I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> both, I mean, if we're going to text to speech and speech to text, we need the text part for both yes. of those problems. Yeah. If we don't have the text, I'm not yeah. sure what we would do. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Probably more often stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, and there are many languages in the world that actually yeah. don't have so, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, I'm not a speech learning, uh, machine learning expert, but <laughs> I think what we're talking about here is understanding concepts and yeah. being able to communicate with concepts. Maybe there are ways to recognize um, certain ways of speaking uh, and, and associate that with the transcriptions in another language, perhaps. Um, I don't think that's something we're looking at right now, and um, certainly it's uh, it's a much harder problem. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a cool question. But I mean, if that that reframing the problem from the question, but if that's the, the problem, if the problem is, can we do speech to text where the source language is language A and the target text is language B? Then yeah. I think that's definitely possible. That's definitely possible. Yeah. So maybe that's an approach. I don't know. Yeah, and when we when we uh, discussing about how to connecting the indigenous language in Taiwan, there some languages don't have text, or uh, you, you need to spell the text in Latin. Yeah. Uh, Latin uh, so yeah, that may be uh, one way. You just show the Chinese sentence and asking the people to record it in their uh, mother language. How I mean, that's one thing I don't know. How prevalent is Latin version of say Formosan or whatever language, the Latin language that are sort of like indigenous here? Like, yeah, I think that uh, we have dictionary for that. Okay, but it's uh, mostly Latin based, yeah, okay. And that's used commonly, I'd say. Yeah. Okay. Let me go. <laughs> okay, so next question may be about some moralities or yeah. this that do you, how you 
thinking about to encourage children. Uh, you know, I, I would love before um, I answer this, I would love if someone in the audience would um, would respond to this. <laughs> 小孩子是錄音嗎對對對就弄一些網路遊戲啊不是就是對這個問題這個態度的嗎你覺得應該嗎我們要不要這樣子你要鼓勵嗎還是就是這個問題他當然在演講提到說需要如果要錄音要十八
we don't have a linguist on staff who knows the phonetics of whatever, Breton or something like this. We just don't. So what we have to be able to do is go from data to actual model that works in sort of the quickest way possible. Um, I think what I didn't mention in, in the diagram is that we do have a, a language model that's actually in there in our system that's sort of external to the thing I didn't have in the diagram, but there is a language model there. Um, language models in also are relatively easy to train. I mean, you just need data, like a whole bunch of sentences, and most of the time for most languages, you can get stuff like Wikipedia data and train the language model on that. But the, we really chose that way of doing things just basically because it's it's easier for a smaller team to get something up and running that has a relatively high quality and actually easy to switch languages to. It's just sort of, <clears throat> and you don't need to do things like this for older hidden markup model ways of doing things. You don't need to do this multi-pass alignment stuff. We, we just need data and throw it at it and let it train for a week or so, and then it's fine. So it's <clears throat> practicality, really sort of getting things done quickly. Honestly, that's the honest answer. <laughs> okay. Another great question is, uh, is it helpful to put emotion in the report that should be acted out or sing it or whisper? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. One of the things which is, let's say, slightly problematic about common voice is that it's often the case when one's presented with a sentence, one just reads it like, like one normally reads, with no emotion, no intonation, nothing in, the, in your voice. However, when you talk to a speech recognition engine, especially if you're mad at it, or happy, or yelling across the room, it's gonna, your voice is going to have intonation. It's going to have a, some kind of curve of, of frequency that's going to vary throughout. Um, so to some extent, what we really want to have is voice that is conversational, like I, I, as you talk to another person, that would be kind of the best ideal case. However, if you put some intonation in it while you're reading, it's actually sort of as good as we're going to get really right now for getting this kind of natural intonation, this natural conversational tone in your voice. So yes, it's good, I'd say, to actually put some kind of energy, tone, emotion, whatever in your voice. So. <laughs> For, for the current traditional Chinese data set, uh, we, we have a question mark and a comma or a shark mark in the in the end of the sentence for some sentences, like just 20, just 10% of the sentence. So yeah, you can do some performance, but not performance too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was feeling that the current recording are too performance. <laughs> yeah, if you show the people the one sentence, yeah, people will try to like behave like their best. You know, maybe we need to change some user interface uh, notice about like just talk like yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So please don't do too much. <laughs> so let's be like an actor. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is speak like like talking to a hundred people. No, just daily talk. So it comes to the last Good question, whoever asked this. Yeah, so we are going to, uh, so Kelly has never had uh, stinky tofu before. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, and Alex, you have, uh, no, you didn't no, that's true. No. Yes. No. Neither of these two have had stinky tofu. Uh, and so we will go get stinky tofu after this. So I think there is a night market close by that we're going to walk to. Um, it's not walk, but by, uh, by car. Oh, it's by car. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Five minutes away. Five minutes by car. Okay. Well, we're going to go to the night market, and I want to extend the invite uh, in case people wanted to come along with us. Can you tell us which, which one it is? Or? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 oh, you already did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought it was walkable, and that would make it easier <laughs> to get to, uh, but it's by car. But we will go there, and if uh, those of you want to join us, 
uh, we are available to continue to talk or just to uh, enjoy stinky tofu or oh, by okay. We can go together by metro if anybody ah. wants to go. Yeah. We'll go by metro. So yeah, yeah. Uh, you're welcome to join us. You're welcome to talk to us. See, this is a participatory design session. This is the essence of what we're here for. Okay, um, yeah, so you're welcome to join us. Uh, no need to join us. Uh, but before we uh, sign off right here, I, I think we still have eight minutes, so if there are any final questions um, that we can... Yes, please. So, uh, because the, the training is time consuming, so have you ever tried anything like uh, DSD to reduce the training time? Actually, the training time I talked about before is for our old model, which is bi-directional. We actually have a PR, which we're working on uh, a pull request. So basically a modification of our code, which is um, training that, uh, exchanging the bi-directional current neural network for a unidirectional one. Mm -hmm. It has other improvements too, but one of the big wins for this architectural change <coughs> is that it reduces tra training time extreme in, in the extreme. So I guess for those four machines, it would take a, a week to train in the old architecture. And the new architecture, uh, I guess I just talked to one of our guys on my team today. He was able to train with the same 3,200 hours of data on one of those machines in two days. So it's like a big win. So I don't know, we don't have to worry about, at least for the near term, we're not too worried about it. I mean, we may try other tricks later, but right now we're kind of like, <laughs> that's a good win. It's a win. So we're like getting down from yeah, four machines, one week to one machine, two days. It's a big, nice improvement. At least for the near term, we're kind of all right. When we start increasing the data more and more and more, we may play around with other techniques, but for now, we're good. Any, any like maybe one more question? Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, so, uh, hey, hey. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Yeah, I'm hiding here. <laughs> okay, so uh, when talk about privacy, uh, I'm wondering when you release the data, voice data, even if you don't group them with contributor, there's still something like technology like uh, voice print or something. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, so the question is, uh, we were releasing this data, but uh, voice is very quickly becoming an identifier. Uh, there's technology called voice biometrics or speaker identification, and this can be tied to a person. Right? And there are privacy concerns around this. Our approach to this so far has been one of, uh, we are boldly moving forward with our eyes open. Because absolutely this data um, does expose privacy concerns. Mm -hmm. However, um, it is the same concerns as posting a picture online. Uh, and many people do this. And so what we advise people, and, and to this point, like we've had to talk to many community members about this, it's donating your voice to Common Voice is not for everyone. Uh, it makes some people feel creepy, uh, just like a lot of people don't like to use Facebook or Instagram or any public place on the internet where they post pictures of themselves, right? So uh, by all means, if it's, if it's something that you don't feel comfortable with, uh, you don't need to donate your voice. Uh, but if you do still believe in the project, you can help us by listening to the voices of others and verifying, curating the data set. And if, even if that's too much, then uh, we can shake hands on that and say, good day. Uh, <laughs> but but it is, it is uh, indeed that all the data that we post online is personally identified in a way with enough machine learning technology, even the way you speak. Um, so our approach is to understand this and to, instead of allowing this very privacy-centric data to exist behind closed doors and in closed silos and only be leveraged in ways that you cannot understand, to create these public data sets so that we can uh, understand what are the ramifications and understand this together and have the research be open and be done in, in such a way that is reproducible outside of these silos. Because 
this data, these collections exist regardless. Um, so uh, again, it's the same as posting a picture online. It's not for everybody. Uh, but for those who are interested in it, it can be used for good. We have a gift for you too, oh, no. which okay. is a CD from two uh, uh, indigenous dinner in Taiwan, who is a Sampui from the Kataban and the uh, Iligaru from the Amis. They are two tribes. Okay. I hope that next time you come, we can like, connect in their languages. Okay. Yeah, okay. after all, everybody's help. Yeah, we, we really need everybody's help to try to make our voice project into more languages, especially more languages in Taiwan, because I, I don't know about like, uh, local languages, I don't know about like, indigenous languages, and I don't know about Hakka, and uh, I don't know about how to write in uh, Taiwanese, but uh, if you know that, you can help, and then yeah, how to help, uh, you can just uh, connecting together, we are uh, connecting with me on the, on the uh, Telegram and line, and then we can talk about how to uh, push that. And that's it for you, too. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know that what they are singing, actually. <laughs> yeah, but you too. So that's <laughs> not the problem. We have technology that can help Really? Really? Well, we, <laughs> we need to build it. <laughs> we need to build a like, recognition, recognition engine and models yeah. in order to do that. OK, cool. Thank you everyone for coming and also thank Irving because he has created this uh, the data set and created this event and he's been great. Thank you for coming. Uh, stay in touch with us. Stay in touch with Do we need to make a, uh, take a photo together? Oh, would you yeah, all sure. like a great photo? Okay for a quick photo? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You selfie, know what we do? Selfie time? Yeah, we're going to take a picture from the top. So you can just do that. Okay. Yeah. And some people take photos.